Hello, I'm Deborah Davis, Director of the Valdosta State University Archives and Special Collections. And I'm Dr. Melanie Bird, Professor in the History Department. Today we're going to be talking about archives, libraries, and historians teaching together, a long-term collaboration. We hope you enjoy it. Hello, this is the mission of the Valdosta State University Archives and Special Collections. The VSU Archives and Special Collections supports the university's commitment to scholarly and creative work, enhances instructional effectiveness. And then, if you read on down to the bottom, you'll see in support of VSU's instructional curriculum. Uh, those are the important parts of our mission statement that kind of relate to the um, subject of today's, uh, today's presentation. The first question you have to ask yourself is why do a teaching program for an archives in the first place? Well, the mission of a university is teaching and research. You should center yourself to do both. Remember, the archives is not a necessary part of the university, is it an extra part, and you have to give it value to make it a necessary part. Now, it's best for the long-term viability of the archives and the library to be heavily invested in instruction, because instruction is the primary mission of the university. And academic archivists and librarians are faculty. In, when faculty go up for tenure and promotion, they have to put their teaching, service, and, and professional growth. Um, when you do that, if you have teaching, faculty recognize that teaching when they are judging you on promotion and tenure committee. And they are able to understand what you do in the context of what they do. Uh, you should also stay within the academic portion of the university that is the last place for budget cuts. It is the most important part of the university. College students need to experience this type of research and primary records and you are especially um, there to give this kind of research, of, of exposure to primary records. Without wide archival experience, people won't contribute stuff, won't save stuff, and won't support the archives. This is helping you build your connections for the future. And the bottom line is, it is worth the work. But if you're starting a teaching program, you have a problem. How do you get them to come to you for teaching? Well, the first thing you do is you visit the faculty and you be very specific about what you can do for them. You talk about specific collections that their students could use for research. So you need to research that faculty and know what they teach. Know what their research is, if you can know that. Um, the other thing you can do is surround the history department. When I took over the archives in 1998, Back in the mid-80s, the archives and the history department were in collaboration together. Somebody in the history department got mad at the director of the library and they quit supporting the archives. So no history professors were teaching with the archives. So what I did was I, I taught wherever I could for other departments and made sure that it was publicized, that people knew about it. I even went out in the schools and talked to sixth graders. Uh, don't be proud, offer to teach when they travel. Professors who go to conferences need something useful for their students to do. And go for the new faculty members. If the old faculty members have gotten used to teaching a certain way and can't see a place for their archives, Often the new faculty members are used to working in archives for their research and can see a place for it. There's different, there's different types of teaching in the archives. Uh, there are one-shot classes for those planning archives orientations, for those planning 
archival research. And in the beginning, there won't be too many of that. It's kind of like bibliographic instruction or library instruction classes, only it's just related to the archives. Another type of teaching is straight library instruction with primary sources included. You may talk about books, interlibrary loan, journal articles, but you'll also talk about primary sources and your archives. Then there's longer term course integrated instruction, perhaps a large research project centered in the archives, and it may include several formal classes and individual meetings. For the purpose of that project, it's like co-teaching. Then there's also the internship or work project that may or may not include a research component. You'll need an orientation for training and then you will supervise the whole work project. Often you'll report grades out to the class professor or to the archives, um, the archives coordinator for your students. Uh, and the last thing is two to three credit semester long courses taught alone or co-taught. The archives is to the historian like a lab is to the scientist. Um, we use our archives here as a teaching lab where students do experiential learning rather than just a repository of information. Yeah. Here are some um, faculty members who first started with the archives, doing um, teaching with the archives. Um, Dr. Oglesby, Dr. Bird, and Dr. Dunn of the History Department and Dr. Davis of the archives have collaborated on a variety of projects for history classes for the past 16 years. The first one and the one we're going to spend the most time on, because all of the ones we're going to talk about, of course, apply to things that USG archivists or librarians can do. But this is a unique program that I think not a lot of archives take advantage of. And it's something that it's a retention uh, solution that could be put in place for most of the archives in the state. Uh, we had a meeting between a history professor who wanted hand on, hands-on experience for entry-level courses, courses in those entry-level surveys, and an archivist with 188 boxes of presidential papers to process who had little help to do that. So we came up with the archives apprenticeships for entry-level history classes, and it turned into a win-win situation. We started with a several part program to have history students learn about primary sources, learn about VSU, and most importantly, gain extra credit. We started with the presidential boxes in the old archives room we had just vacated. Um, we, the students would do basic processing and inventorying on the presidential papers. They would change out the folders, they would pull all the staples and paper clips, they would describe the folders into our database, and over a couple of years with these volunteers, we got 188 boxes uh, divided up, described into a database. We later migrated that database to our Archon system and last year migrated it to our archive space system. So none of those things that the students did were lost. Um, this started in 2004 and we have had over 800 students work over 24,000 hours in the archive. We've, we have changed what the students do. They now index the Valdosta Daily Times for births, deaths, and marriages. They index the Campus Canopy Spectator Campus Newspapers article by article, and we've created major databases that have been used all over the country with volunteer student work. Here are three perspectives 
from professors on why to come to the archives. Um, this is Dr. Oglesby. Um, history students need to understand primary sources and secondary sources and what the differences are. What an archives is and how it relates to the study and understanding of history. The work necessary to make primary sources meaningful. How working in an archives is a potential career path for historians. Uh, Dr. Bird um, already had a history of working on programs uh, with uh, alumni in the archives. This is me wearing an old school uniform from the early 20th century. How does it meet a professor's goals? Because it gives students a chance to do history instead of just reading about it. It is a way that students who have trouble, and many do, with the abstract part of history that they can still be exposed to historical methodology, texts, and artifacts. It's a way to get students into the library and to see how vital a library is and an archives are to the college experience. It is a fair and intellectually challenging way for students to truly earn extra credit. It's not given to them. They're really doing something useful to earn it. As a professor, I want to help students achieve the grade that they feel they can earn. And this is a valid way of doing it. It opens their minds and it makes the past come alive. It connects them to the heritage of the campus. They see the school as a history and a culture. It is a way to get students interacting with other students and library faculty whom they might not ever meet. It shows them the foundation of research that maybe they can apply to different topics for other classes. Uh, this is what we call transfer of knowledge, which is a vital skill we try to teach. Archives is competent to access, assess the skill, and it's easy to tell the credit from the spreadsheet. This is Dr. Dunn's QEP archives program where he took students to an archives in the Northeast at Dickinson College in Pennsylvania. Uh, and he donated a large collection and is an active participant in the extra credit program in the History 3000. That's our basic intro methodology seminar. Um, there were projects have juniors doing everything from processing and describing small collections to indexing the Equal Rights Newsletter from the 1920s, um, and that's more sophisticated indexing than the volunteers would do. These are Dr. Dunn's reasons for working with the archives. It will help students. It shows them different ways of learning. It helps the library. They're learning library skills in a different way. If they don't take tests well, they can show what they are doing. Doing 60 hours took one student from a D to an A, and you know he aced the final. It also shows history students a possible career focus they never thought of before. Um, there are students who have gone on to work in the archives and gone on to that as a career field. Um, academic libraries, now all the things we've been talking about so far apply to, to teaching classes with the archives, but they specifically apply to this volunteer program. Now academic libraries have traditionally not utilized volunteers. Public libraries and historical libraries utilize them well and extensively. <coughs> there are some limitations for volunteers in academic libraries. The limitation have, has traditionally come down to insurance, parking, and the attitude of the administration towards volunteers. But when you use students as volunteers, you bypass all of those issues. The insurance, they are covered if it's a class activity or in the library studying, and this is a class activity. The parking has already been dealt with because they're on campus. There's administrative support because this is the educational mission of the unit, and it is a retention initiative for the history department. Um, 
the motivation of the students, the grades are primary. Um, a lot of these students that come to us are poor students, but we put them to work on something that's very streamlined that they can do and we get a good product out of it. Doing this for the good of the institution is very much a secondary thing. We do have good students come in who are interested in the archives, interested in future archives work. We have honor students that also participate in this program. So, um, but the grades are the primary motivation for most of the students that come in. And it intimately teaches them the nature of primary source materials. There are special considerations for the archives to adopt a program like this. For example, how will students handle the materials? Our student newspapers are fragile, so we photocopy them and have the students read the photocopies, mark up forms, and then enter things into a database. They do not work with the originals, so they can make notes and cross through articles they've already done. And another thing is what can they do with little to no training? It takes about 15 minutes to train someone to do the indexing. How to supervise these volunteers without taking time from other patrons' research needs or other projects that the archives is working on. Well, we have, we now, we used to have student workers working down in the room with them when they were doing the presidential papers and the student workers would be working on something else for the archives. Now we house the program, uh, which relates to the next point, in our archives reading room. And so students, as they go about their work, and our staff, as they go about their work, can answer questions, ask how the students are doing, see if they have any problems, and it's just a part of our work day. It is not something we have to work to do. Another question is how to make the project useful for, to us. We know it's useful to the history department because it's retention. We know it's useful to the students because it gets them the grades they want. But to make it useful for us, we have to pick projects that we could not, that are good to have done, that are simple, but that we otherwise couldn't afford to do. So that's what we've done with having them go through microfilm to find birth, birth announcements, obituaries, and marriage announcements to create a vital records index, which is very useful to genealogists and to index the Campus Canopy newspaper and the Spectator newspaper, which is interesting for um, people doing research about the school, which is very often the administration or other offices. Now, we currently have a lot of the newspapers digitized, but the index is still more useful than in-text searching of digitized items because the index actually tells you what the article is about. And you can copy and paste the date of the article into our place where the index start, where the scanned articles are, and it'll pull up that um, newspaper immediately. So the index is still useful even with scanned items. And um, then how to make sure they learn and it applies to their studies. Well, think about what they're doing. The ones that are doing the, camp, the newspapers, the Campus Canopy newspapers, are reading, picking out names, picking out subjects, and writing a short summary of each article. The ones that are doing the Vital Records Index are working with microfilm, they're pulling out names. They notice the fact that in the past they would have put the black deaths on the same page as the white deaths. So they're learning a lot of history and the steps they do like taking notes and summarizing directly relate to any history studies that they do. Um, and how to keep track of their time and effort. We do that by sign in and sign out sheets. We do that by collecting the 
forms that they fill out and enter into the database. We keep all that information in a spreadsheet, which we give to the teachers with their time awarded at the end of the semester. The student rewards, their grades, the future classes that they choose to take sometimes are based on whether they have this volunteer program available. Um, no, that was Melanie's part. You talk about grades. Okay. Yes, students always come and say, you know, what can I do to bring up my grade? And this is the best thing that they can do. And they're so happy to do it. And it also definitely is a recruitment tool for future classes. And verbal appreciation is really important because students, some of whom are very insecure, they're poor students, they're getting recognized by their professor and by the library faculty. Another thing that's important is this program leads to possible jobs in the archives. We have a hiring pool of history majors only with a 3.0 GPA <clears throat> who have volunteered or taken a class with us. So some of the good students will participate in this program because they want future jobs working with history materials. So this gives us exposure to a wide variety of students from which we can choose to make informed hiring decisions because we already know how hard these students will work. This is a written evaluation from a history professor, Dr. Oglesby, and you can see how detailed it is. Um, this project, along with Ms. Deborah Davis, this presentations of the history of Aldosta State University provides for students a look at how microhistory, history at a very local level, fits with the larger picture. Okay, this is really important historical concept here. Uh, Ms. Davis surveys the history of VSU through the progressive era into the 1980s. They get to hear and see what life was like at VSU during the Depression, World War II, and the Civil Rights Movement, for instance. By working with and contextualizing the archival sources, students come to understand something of both the art and the craft of the historian. Students work in microfilm in the university's officials' papers, such as those of the most recently retired Dr. Hugh Bailey, and at cataloging newspapers from a specified time frame. For example, although they take on the assignment obviously for extra credit, they discover and appreciate the value of hands-on learning. So they get a lot out of this. When we have students that are in American history classes, we have an extra element of this, which is a presentation on the history of the school. That obviously does not apply if they are world history or ancient history students. We've learned lessons over time. It takes planning, planning, and more planning. Handouts, changing your schedules, for example, for those people that work during the day, we keep the archives open until 7 p.m. with student workers two nights a week. Um, we have to make sure to hire enough student workers and we can hire from among our volunteers. We've created a training manual. And we learned that orientation timing depends on the professor in the class, not on the archives. We used to announce orientations and students could volunteer to come. We did not get enough students that way. So now we go out at a time of the professors choosing into their class for a little 15 minute presentation on this project and it brings the students in. One thing we learned is that history is older than me unless it's really cool. But that's not too hard to do because these students are, for the most part, very young. Um, I think we had to close the program for COVID. Obviously, we couldn't have a lot of people in the reading room. And we have a year's worth of newspapers that trace the development and growth of the COVID vaccine, that trace the um, election and the election violence and the controversy that we had. And I think that even though those are modern and they just lived through it, 
those are going to be really cool for them to index. So we're going to throw that at them in the next semester. Uh, we learned that people can't come in the last week or two of the program and get this done. So we have a rule that you have to come and sign up for the program in archives uh, before midterm. If you don't sign up before midterm, you cannot do this program. And we have had to turn away students every semester, but we do this because we get better work from them if they start earlier. And we also learned that record keeping is constant. You have to keep up with the fact that they have to sign in and you have to record those on your spreadsheet. We also check at the end of the semester that all of their materials made it in the database. If something was done on a form but didn't make it in a database, we put it in a notebook and we give it to the next batch of students to enter. Uh, it has led to new projects and more partners. There are more professors involved. Four to five professors in a given, uh, in a given semester. And some of these professors have maybe up to three classes. So we have a lot more volunteer groups. We have more levels of, it's brought in more levels of students. We now have special projects for juniors and interns as well as volunteers and these projects are of different complexity. We're always looking for new projects that are older than me as far as the students goes and tying the appropriateness of the project to the student level is a key for success. For example, the freshman and sophomore volunteers work with microfilm and they work with photocopy newspapers items that cannot be damaged. The juniors work with originals. They may be making finding aids for small collections. They may be creating parts of finding aids that are going to be put together in a larger collection. They may be indexing something that is complex like the Equal Rights Newsletter or the Southern Patriot Newspaper, a labor and civil rights newspaper. And so, keying the appropriateness of the project to the student level is key to success. You can also use student volunteers on odd and short-term projects. When we have public programming, we had our student volunteers participate in that. When we need to clean the vault and vacuum with our HEPA filter vacuum, guess who does that? When we took in a great big collection and needed help off-site boxing it up, we called on a few of our better student volunteers. The results has been expansive growth in our teaching program. Two to five professors are heavily enrolled in the program. This has led for other opportunities to team teach with the history professor for majors and higher level students. For example, the Experiential Learning History 3000 Work Project is now written into the curriculum of the history department. The MLIS program has participated with online archives projects and I currently teach a course for the MLIS program every spring. Overall, the archives teaching program including volunteer classes has expanded to approximately 30 classes per semester from three to four. The results of this problem has led to growth in our archives. That we have hiring options from our student volunteers. They tend to bring friends in to further volunteer that maybe don't even get extra credit. This program has been highly recognized on campus as a retention initiative and it has been recognized around the state with a GRAB award. It's a natural mag we're a natural magnet for student workers and interns now. When I first started, we were getting nursing majors and communications majors. Now we have just majors. The archives applies to their area of studies. Usually only graduate students get opportunity to do work in their area of studies. 
raw work is done that we can use to process and make bigger things like big collections. Can We can use student processing for some of the um, finding aid, these big databases that we have that get used all over the place. Students will come back to us get, and ask reference questions and get our help. We sort of become their librarian archives because they've been there for a whole semester. And we've gotten opportunities from this to teach our team teach with different departments. And we're now officially included in the history department's experiential learning and teaching curriculum. That means we're now more than ever necessary to the teaching mission of the university. There are financial considerations. One semester, students worked a total of 469 hours. At $725 an hour, we would have had to pay students almost $3,500 to get similar work done from students. Our paid student assistants work on archival projects and boxes while supervising, so the cost related to the project was very small. It's like getting a grant without having to write one. And as I said, we've brought in more than $24,000 of free labor into the archives over the years. That's yours. Oh, sorry, that's mine. Let me flip. Um, here are some, we want to talk now about some successful other teachings about other than the volunteer program. We want to urge you to start a volunteer program, but we want to talk about our other teaching programs. We have a special collection of Babylonian clay tablets that have received a lot of press over the years. They've become the cornerstone of a successful teaching presentation that is used with different departments from history to English to actually mathematics. Deborah Davis and I started at VSU at the same time, and we both were very much fans of the author Agatha Christie, who, second husband, was a Mesopotamian archaeologist, and we got to talking about that one day. And Deborah told me, do you know we have some cuneiform tablets in our archive? And I said, no, may I see them? And that is how we started working on them and thought, hey, we can really use these and integrate these into the class. Won't it be fun for the students to see them? Well, she used to bring them around to my classes in person with the little white gloves and everything. But then when I taught a library science course on the history of books and reading and writing, that was an online course, and I said, oh, we have to scan these. And so we put them online, and that was a game changer for us. With the tablets online, we started getting requests from international Assyriologists to translate them. We went with one from UCLA and got translations, which he published. And images that we have made of our tablets and the translations are now in the International Cuneiform Digital Library Initiative database used by scholars all over the world. Any student at VSU that takes ancient history, Near Eastern history, um, winds up coming to the archives and learning about these tablets. This is a display of the small tablets uh, that Deborah and I created. It's in the archives and everybody can see them, but I am one of the professors, definitely the history professor, who brings uh, my classes here unfailing every semester and sometimes two classes in a semester. Over COVID, unfortunately, we couldn't have the students come to the archives. So I went out to their classes, sometimes two or three times, depending on the size of the classes and how hybrid they were, and used our website, which has all this information and the images of the tablets, to teach the class. And when we evaluated it, the one thing that they said they wished was that they could actually see the tablet. So that was a loss over COVID. Because they're so fascinated that we have something that old. 
Okay, library instruction. This is very important to history professors. Uh, one way of teaching is to combine library instruction like book and journal research along with research in the special collections. We turn the archives into a classroom to teach a wide variety of classes. It makes a world of difference to have the students in the library learning in person how to use the library. This is a course I teach on food and world history where the students have to do a group presentation uh, and Deborah Davis is instructing them on all the materials that we have or can obtain for them for their projects. This is a significant handout, um, 10 pages, that we created for the History of Food class. It covers books, journals, primary sources, when we teach, we like to have something the students can take with them to help them remember, uh, kind of as a study tool. And we remake, we have handouts for other classes as well. We remake those handouts every semester depending on what topics the students have chosen to research. And we make those handouts together. They would be much weaker were they made only by the archivist. The subject expertise of the professor really makes these things uh, valuable. Okay. okay, another class that we developed uh, is a three-part intensive archives instruction for seniors in the history capstone class that I teach. Uh, Deborah turns the archive into a computer lab with help from the Media Center and the students spend one day learning how to find books and how to use interlibrary loan. Another, they use journal databases and online interlibrary loan resources to get materials. And the third day, um, Deborah brings in um, abundant primary sources that we have in the library to the class and also she shows them how to use books and primary sources that have been digitized that are online by different institutions. Um, she has to do this because uh, the topic is usually ancient Greek and Roman history and so there are no archival sources that we have for that but we do have a lot of things in print that she brings in and shows the students and they get to work with those sources in the archives. They get started on their research. And so we really turn this into um, an intensive get started on your project um, course. And all the handouts from this change every semester depending on what topic the students have. Okay, and again, um, it's important that we keep those handouts updated because the students are kind of intimidated by their senior seminar and they're a little lost in their topics. When they're in class uh, for each of these sessions, uh, they use the computer uh, to search and they have to complete an exercise for each day. And that's to um, demonstrate so that we can assess what they learned and so that they understand that what they're learning is important and is going to be evaluated. Why this three-day orientation is so vital to me is the capstone class, the senior seminar, is very daunting to students. And they're writing a minimum 20-page paper and their first panic is where are we going to find the sources for this, especially the primary sources. And so the three-day orientation teaches them to research. They start doing the research under the supervision of both of us. Again, with Deborah showing them the skills, me answering questions about content. And they understand with this kind of total immersion for three days, they really learn how to do research, even how to find things they might thought they could never get a hold of. Yeah, and there's a 10 page or more handout that goes with this, but they have different worksheets that they have to fill out each day. And they have to make orders for Gill Express, they have to make orders for ILL, they have to find books and find journal articles. And so at the end of this three day class period, and then the primary sources, they have a working bibliography for their paper that they have created with our advice and supervision.
In 2018, we started teaching a semester-long perspectives course on libraries, archives for historians to freshman history majors. They spend time in the archives researching primary sources on civil rights and they write a paper, a short paper. This is an entry-level freshman class, so the paper is something like five to seven pages. Uh, but it is based on primary sources, so we're teaching them right away the importance of primary sources to historical research, right away the importance of archival work. Uh, they read archive articles and history articles. They take a variety of quizzes over the materials. We have class discussions. We teach them other useful basic entry-level skills like how to take notes, how to take tests. Uh, we do a lot of the mechanical explanation of, you know, this is the nuts and bolts of how you put a paper together. Once you found your sources, this is how you read them and analyze and interpret and contextualize them. Basically, it is how to research like a historian for freshmen that gives them, again, experiential, hands-on work in the archives. This class is offered every fall, and we team teach it. And of course, we vary it a little bit. We make improvements and adjustments each semester. And every semester we've taught it, I've wound up hiring one or two students from this class. Okay, this is just a look at the syllabus uh, with the outcomes and the goals. Uh, we go over this on the first day uh, because the students need some basic exposure uh, to what we expect of them, what some key terms that they're going to encounter for historical work and for archival work are, and we need to get the class um, set up for them so that they know what are the historical components as far as content, as far as historical methodology, and then what are the components that specifically relate to the archives, and then how do we put them together. Okay, we spell out what we do every day and where we meet. And this is important because some days we're in a classroom, some days we're in the library, and some days we are specifically in the archive. Um, this class is a regular and a valued part now of the history curriculum and we even published an article this year with the history department head for an education periodical on this. Um, the benefits of libraries and, ar and archives teaching, librarians and archives teaching with the history department. To sum up, the work is critical to our mission within the university. It gets students into the archives and the library that wouldn't otherwise be there and it gets them in earlier. This is yours. Information literacy. Information literacy is a critical skill for professors to impart in their classes, especially with the rise of the internet, and this program makes it so much easier to do. And the volunteer program is part of the university's retention effort and increasingly popular in the history department. And experiential learning is becoming more central to university's educational mission. And we're now a large part of that experiential learning, which is you know, now embedded in the curriculum. And that is so important for the archives because part of its reason for being is now recognized within the curriculum as if you change archivists or librarians, you don't have to build the relationships anew, they're in the curriculum. You're already there. The next person that comes after you is already there. So that represents a stable teaching program and that's what's been achieved over the years. Now, we are done with our preservation presentation. We hope you have questions. You can also contact us for more information. There's our email addresses on the um, screen there. 
you want to say something? Um, yes, this is an excellent program. I highly recommend it. I have lost track now of how many students have had their grades saved and have actually passed my class because of the volunteer program. Uh, and how much easier it is for me to teach really challenging abstract concepts simply by moving into the archives and doing it hands-on. Yes, and it's really a rewarding thing to do. So ask us any questions that you want.